So good morning. Come on, come on. Thank you for coming. This is a, uh, one of my favorite occasions on campus. I'd like to also recognize if anybody here helped decorate the campus today. Uh, thank you for your great work overnight and uh, getting all the fill materials all over our community. This is a uh, important reason. We hopefully trying to create a culture where we realize it's more about the rest of the world than just about us. And this is one of those days where we start thinking about how we can reach out and extend our hand to the rest of the world. And that rest of the world may be just across town or across class, um, across the sidewalk, but wherever we are in the world, people need our help. And we need to give our treasures, our talents, um, and support. And so this is the reason why we pause for a week to celebrate philanthropy. And Phil is indeed with us. Andy, I've known for a couple of years, we'll let him tell his story in a moment. Um, but I think you're going to hear a remarkable journey that he's had personally and with his family and with his friends about as you get to a station in life, how do you make a difference? And how do you reach that hand out to other parts of the world? I think we're going to hear a lot about several parts that he's gotten engaged in and activities, and many of them will relate to health care in some of these remote parts of the world that really are in need. And with that in mind, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the person who's going to introduce Andy, <laughs> which is Mickey Frazee. And it's only fitting that Mickey's with us. She's a third year Carver College of Medicine student. Um, I think at this stage pretty well focused on obstetrics and gynecology and has also spent time reaching out and impacting other parts of the world. Uh, I think you've done a, uh, tried to connect physicians around here and in other parts of northern Europe uh, with dermatology so that they're using the, 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 the globe is in fact connected and using some of the technology that as physicians in Northern Europe uh, get into issues that we, they can connect to physicians here who might be able to help them diagnose and treat their patients. You've also uh, spent some time, I think, also in India doing some wonderful things. And so it's with that that I think it makes Mickey a, a wonderful candidate and introducer of Andy Code. Um, Mickey grew up not in Iowa, but in Lincoln, Nebraska. But then she matriculated to UNI a little north of here where you studied in biology and biochemistry. Um, and so she's a, a, a wonderful student here. Mickey, why don't you come up and introduce Andy? Thank you very much. Give him Welcome, and on behalf of the university, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Your presence today shows your commitment to building and growing a culture of philanthropy here at Iowa, a community I'm so thankful to be a part of. Today, we have the opportunity to celebrate the spirit of Phil. It is a chance to appreciate the philanthropy, which is giving back to help others in our university that permeates every aspect of our environment. It is a chance to recognize the time, money, knowledge, and expertise that makes our experience at Iowa so remarkable. And finally, it is a chance to hear from those who have committed to making positive changes and to learn how we can give back and make a difference. The reason I get to stand before you today is not without the long list of people who have committed their lives to promoting the welfare of others. My education, my experiences, and my passions have all in one way or another been impacted by Phil. Today, I have the privilege of introducing you to a University of Iowa graduate who has dedicated his professional and personal life to giving back. I myself am one of the many who have directly been impacted by the generosity of today's speaker, Andy Code. The Code Family Foundation, for which Mr. Code serves as president, has made generous donations to the, um, the University of Iowa, Roy J. and Lucille A. Carver College of Medicine, and these gifts have helped students like me to travel to Niger to provide vital health care in an area that drastically lacks the necessary resources. My experience in Niger has directly impacted my decision to pursue a career in obstetrics and gynecology and has solidified my desire 
to incorporate global health into a long-term career. Andy Code has proven himself as a business innovator, a global advocate for health and human services, and a constant supporter of education. He is founder and, ch and chairman of Promise Capital and Promise Equity Partners, a multifamily investment firm. He also established CHS Capital, a $2.9 billion equi private equity fund where he served as a partner for 24 years. He is a founder and chair of Chicago Fellowship, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping its participants become generous stewards of their lives through the participation in acts of justice and compassion. Andy also sits on the University of Iowa Center for Advancement Board and serves as its investment committee, where he has been the committee chair since 2014. And as I mentioned earlier, as president of the Code Family Foundation, he has made generous donations to the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine to allow students and faculty alike to serve the greater health needs of those in developing countries in the areas of family and internal medicine, obstetrics, gynecology, and pediatrics. Mr. Code truly is a direct embodiment of the spirit of Phil. At the conclusions of today's talk, you'll all have the chance to ask Andy your questions. And so with that, please welcome me and joining our 2017 Life with Phil speaker, Andy Code. Thanks, Mickey. That was uh, overwhelming. Um, <laughs> when you come back to a city you grew up in, you never know what to expect. And uh, I see friends from high school here and family here. And it is overwhelming to be able to be able to speak. And, and it's humbling because I don't know if my words will do uh, enough to really express my gratitude to this university and this great state. <clears throat> in 1843, <clears throat> Charles Dickens wrote a book called the Christmas Story. You, many times you've seen the movie, you've probably read the book, and Ebenezer Scrooge was a, a miserly old man. He was an investment banker and he was, a, he was a stockbroker. And he lived by himself. And he basically had his arms around his money for years and years. One night on Christmas Eve, he went to sleep and his partner approached him in a dream. <clears throat> and he talked about the, creek, the three Christmases, the Christmas of the past, where he saw himself empty and lonely and all by himself with his piles of money. They talked about the Christmas of today, where he ran a business where he had Bob Cratchit and his little son, Tiny Tim. And Tiny Tim had a disease that was incurable, but, but Scrooge kept on tightening the, the screws on his business. And pretty soon, he couldn't even afford to pay for the care for Tiny Tim. And then he saw the Christmas of the future. And the Christmas of the future was him hauling chains down below, hauling chains and getting nowhere, just dragging these chains. And he woke up from this dream, and he woke up a new man. He woke up a man that felt generous and enthusiastic for life, and he called Cratchit into his office, and he gave him a raise, and he gave him the money to, to get the treatment. And Tiny Tim went on to live, and even though their family was happy and had little, and was, was, was joyful even through their, their misery. They had a new life and a new lease on life. And Scrooge changed from that moment on. He realized that life was not about building bigger barns and having his arms around his wealth. And he was released from this prison, which many of us chase. Tom Brady, after one of his Super Bowls, was asked in an interview, you've got the most beautiful wife, you've got you're good looking, you've got all this money, you've got Super Bowl rings. And he was, he said, he just sat there and he shook his head. He goes, there's got to be something more. Muhammad Ali, right before he died, said, I had everything, but I had nothing. 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wealthy tax collector. Many of you heard the story if you went to catechism or you were in in Sunday school. Zacchaeus was a short man, and Zacchaeus had done what the Romans asked all these tax collectors to do, go around and collect money from the, the Jewish people in Israel and, in, and all over the land. And they hated the tax collectors, because the tax collectors would just screw them down to nothing, and they'd take this money and they'd live by themselves. Well, when Jesus was walking through the countryside, Zacchaeus wanted to get a glimpse of him. He climbs up the fig tree. You've heard this story 
climbs up the fig tree, and out of nowhere, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to spend the night with you. And all the disciples said, don't go spend, this guy's, a, this guy's a sinner. This is the guy that takes our money. And Zacchaeus came down, they had dinner in his house, and he said, I want to tell you that I have, I have taken money I shouldn't have taken. From this moment forward, I'm going to give half my money away. I'm going to give it back to the people. And anyone that I've cheated, I'm going to give four times what I've given in the past. And Jesus looked at him and said, today you've met your salvation. And Zacchaeus went on and lived a different life. I grew up in Iowa City. I went to West High School. My dad was at the Press Citizen for 36 years. <clears throat> Hard-working man. My mom was sitting here, school teacher. Um, two of the most generous people I've ever met. My dad insisted that I, <clears throat> I work from the time I was 10 years old on, so I had a paper out. He never, ever gave me an allowance. He said, you know, you have to learn the value of money. So from the time I was 10, I had a paper out, and then I started working after school. I worked every day unless I had sports. And I was a decent athlete. I wasn't a great athlete, but I played on the West High basketball team and the West High baseball team and um, had a really good experience in, in, at West High. I had a chance my sophomore year. I was the runner. I was the backup quarterback, and I was getting ready to go out. I got hit by a car, broke my leg. And so my sophomore year, I'm sitting there, and on the hill at West High, I had dreams of being the quarterback. I, was, I had aspirations to be. I, I probably wouldn't have made it anyway. But um, what you think as you're 15 years old. And all of a sudden, I thought my life was shattered. It was shattered. So I had an opportunity. There's a, a man that sat next to me, and Tom Dupringer, who's a good friend of mine, knows him well. His name was Vern Hill. He ran a... He ran a uh, organization in Iowa City called Young Life. He sat down beside me and I didn't know what he was doing. I was just sitting there moping because I had this huge cast on my leg and I wasn't playing football. And he introduced me to an organization called Young Life and I had an opportunity through Young Life to see what Zacchaeus saw. And I'm telling you this not as a religious talk. I'm just telling you because if you don't know me for who I am and what makes me driven, it's like taking the fizz out of Coca-Cola. You have to understand what drives me. And this is what drives me. He introduced me to this faith that Zacchaeus found, and I've lived this life, and I've tried to live this life out where that motivation comes from within, this personal relationship I have with Jesus, and I've fallen away many times. I went on to Iowa after West High, and I got an undergrad degree in business, and then I got my MBA here, and I started out at American National Bank in Chicago, which is now J.P. Morgan, and I worked there for five years. I got married after my senior year in college at the age of 21, so my wife and I moved to to Chicago in 1981, and we started the race. And everything about modern culture is about the race. You're taught from preschool on that you should be the winner, you should be first, your grades should be good, you need to be in the front of the line. Everything that this world teaches you is about getting ahead. And I was pretty good at that. I had good grades, I was reasonably aggressive, I had this job, which was a meritocracy, which allowed me to produce at a very fast pace. By the time I was 26, Citicorp hired me to run half of the Chicago office of the Leverage Finance Group. I worked there for three years. After three years, three other vice, two other vice presidents, myself, started a private equity fund in 1988. We were the third private equity fund in the city of Chicago. Today, there's over 300. So we raised $82 million at the age of 29. We started buying companies, bought 11 companies with the first $82 million. We bought 25 add-on acquisitions. We created a big company. We turned that $82 million into $374 million. It's not all mine, it goes to our investors, but we got a little bit of it, and we were off. We raised four more funds. We raised $2.7 billion. We bought over 386 companies. I tell you this not to brag, I'm just telling you this was the world I was in. My partners, and the people in this industry started getting pretty full of themselves. Pretty soon it was multiple houses, it was cars, it was rings, it was watches, it was private airplanes. Like I say, the race was on. Bigger was better and there was no cap. There was no cap. Pretty soon, I started to feel the fear of losing what was in my barns. I started be afraid that the stuff was going to be taken away from me. 
And then when I failed, when a deal went bad, I feared that people would no longer respect me for what I was. My identity had shifted from what I told you before, this faith that I had, it had shifted over time because I was in the race. I was in this current. I couldn't get out of the current. So, I don't know. I mean, people say that money is the root of all kinds of evil, and if you don't have it, it's the root because you don't have it. And I'll tell you that when you do have it, it's the root of all evil because all you feel like you have to do is protect it. And the stories I told you about Ebenezer Scrooge, I could tell you countless stories. And I'm going to enumerate several of them here today from people that are the most unlikely people that have had a chance to experience the blessing that comes from giving back. As President Harold said, your time, talents, and your treasures. Many of us don't have the resources to give our money, but everybody has been given talent, and everybody has been given time to serve. And my journey has taken me to lots of different places. Um, while I was in this spiraling path at CHS, uh, I realized a couple things. I was raising two young boys. They were growing up in Hinsdale, Illinois. Hinsdale, Illinois is an extraordinarily wealthy community. The kids get cars on their 16th birthday. They worry about which Ivy League school they're going to go to and start prepping for it at the age of 13. It's, it's a rat race, and we lived in a big house in Hinsdale. And I was so afraid that my kids were going to grow up in a different way than my parents had raised me with the value of money and the value of other people. And so I started asking questions about how I could take a step away and take a step into a different world. And there were several things that, that really helped me. I had uh, two or three friends, and uh, the first thing we did is we, we formed an accountability group. There's four of us, and, and we were all successful in the worldly sense. And we said, let's, let's build these resources, let's pool them together, and let's find a way to go out and invest you know, millions of dollars in, this, in the third world and in the poor parts of Chicago. And we called ourselves the X-Men for multiplication. And you know, it was, it was a, you know, a conceived notion. But what happened was that group became a support group for all of us. We started going through all of us, started going through personal things in our lives where kids weren't healthy or people were facing divorce or they were facing tragedy or death in their families. And we found that that group we'd formed a friendship held us together as, as men trying to do life, because so many times men are isolated. Women do a much better job of forming friendships and having people they can talk to. Men, are, men want to just internalize and they take it with them. And, and what I found is that these, this group of guys that were roughly my age and, and roughly in the same socioeconomic group that I traveled in, we formed that. So we called ourselves the X-Men. We started meeting regularly and talking about the real issues in life. And that was good. That was really, really good. I formed what uh, Mickey talked about, the Chicago Fellowship. It was a group of guys. We started doing a Bible study on Friday mornings in our office, and pretty soon we had 30 guys, 50 guys. We had to get a bigger office today. We have 1,300 businessmen and ministry leaders in the city of Chicago. These are the finance people. These are the accountants. These are, and then most of the major ministries in the city of Chicago come to this. We meet every Friday. We do a retreat in Wisconsin. We take mission trips all over. It's just it just formed. It wasn't some plan. We just started meeting, and people said, this is really cool what you're talking about. You're talking about the real issues in life. You're not talking about building more things. You're talking about what is it that creates value internally that changes the DNA from inside your heart? What is it? So we started talking about those issues, and men would come and come and flock. We have 1,300 men on that have self-selected themselves onto our website that come in. That was the second thing I did. And then I said, i got to get my kids out of Hinsdale, let them see the other world, not just the four seasons in, in Mexico. I want them to see the way that the, the two billion people that are at the bottom end of the pyramid that live on two dollars a day or less, I want them to see how those people live and how they survive and how our lives can become intertwined. So I sought a number of different advice from a number of different people. We ended up going down um, to Comiagua, Honduras. Brenda, my sister-in-law, came with us that day. It was 2001. It was before 9-11. Because I remember we had some machetes with us on the plane on the way home. They were literally, we just checked them. <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. And so we went down to Comiagua with a group, a friend of mine, Al Harima, who had sold his garbage business for $3 million. And he was plowing his $3 million back into this thing in Honduras. I go, I want to understand what he's doing. And he went down and a woman named Karma Batetta was a 
young nun in this convent. She was 19 years old, and she had moved into this convent, and they brought two young kids that had been orphaned to her in this convent. And she's the first of many silhouettes I'm going to paint for you here this morning. And they brought her in. The senior mother opens the door of the convent. She said, we don't, we're not an orphanage here. We're a convent. I can't take these kids. And Carmen pops her head over the shoulder of the senior mother, and she said, I'll take them. She took these kids. A week later, there was eight. Today, there's well over 5,000 kids that have matriculated through that orphanage. She has 200 kids there. We went down there, and we started working with these kids. We stayed at Hotel Kwan. We had plastic sheets and a sheet on the top that said, Property of Miami Prison, on the sheets. There was cockroaches. There was one bulb. The sheets fell off, and so by the end of the night, you were rolling around in the plastic. We had bologna sandwiches for lunch. But it was one of the best five days of my life. And we got to know kids down there. And I started going back. I started bringing my friends down. I started bringing my friends' wives down. I started bringing my friends' kids down. I've taken over a dozen, over 20 trips down there. There's been literally hundreds of trips down to this little teeny village called Comiagua, Honduras. Why do we go there? There's no reason. It's just one of the thousands of cities in this world that doesn't have as much as we have. But the people down there, you can't slap the smiles off their faces. They have nothing. But they sit side by side, and so I formed some relationships with some people. I didn't formally adopt a woman, but this little girl was named Gloria Valadares, and I got to know her, and today she's a mother of two, and I've had a chance to sponsor her kids through the grade school system, and she's gotten married, and she wants to get divorced, and it's messy. It's messy. But she's, you know, she's part of my family. And I got to know her, and I started seeing what was really important in my life. And my boys saw it, and my boys have gone back many, many times, and they've taken their friends back, and they've introduced my friends, and my boys' lives changed. And it wasn't that they don't still have a lot. They still do. They went to the University of Colorado. My oldest son went to Northwestern, got his MBA. They're bright kids. They work with me in the family office. They have things. They have a good salary. But deep down, they've got this rooted love for other people and this rooted love for giving back. And it's changed them. And it's changed them. It's changed my wife, and it's changed my whole family. And that got me back on the right path. And I started, started, so fast forward. Now it's, that was in 2001. I've did it many, many years. So 2008 comes, 2009 comes. Any of you in finance? You realize the market crashes. Stock market's down 50%. Well, that didn't not affect the private equity industry. Our portfolio was marked at 1.2. All of a sudden, it's at 0.8. So all of a sudden, our portfolio, this is a billion three fund, our, our fund five, and it's not so much fun anymore. <laughs> we're, we're having to fix companies. People are getting laid off. Revenue is down. Banks are screaming. The whole world changes. We get through it. We kind of work our way through. 2010 comes. They want to start, our partners start to, they want to raise a $2 billion fund. $2 billion fund. It's a big fund. Even in New York, that's a big fund. Chicago, it's a huge fund. And I said, I'm out. I'm out. I don't want to do it anymore. I got enough. I got enough. I'll help you raise it, but I'm out. I want to go work with some people that are going to focus on the things that I'm, I think are important in life. And I left, and nobody could understand it. They said, how does the founding partner of one of the biggest funds in Chicago leave a private equity world? Why would you do that? Because I wasn't enjoying it when I get up in the morning. I no longer had that passion. When I see people here, I see, I see one of the great things you have about President Harold, he's got passion. He's here. He's got passion. And if I don't see passion and drive in people, you don't follow them. You don't follow them. So I, I'd lost that passion. I couldn't even hire people with any conviction anymore because I no longer wanted to do this. I said, I want to go work with some people that are aligned with my values. And so I did. So I did. I went to work with another family, the Musso family in Chicago. And any of you are football fans, Johnny Musso was the Italian stallion for Alabama. And his sons were 10 or 15 years younger than me. And they had sold their business. And they wanted to pool assets. So we took our family money and pooled it together with their family. We started a family office. And we called it Promus. And if you know your Latin people, Promus means stewardship in Latin. And we said, we're going to build something different here. We're going to build something where values 
and caring about people matter. And that's what we did. Today we have, ironically, a billion three in assets <laughs> under us. We have 27 families that have come on board, another 150 that invest in our products. And I tell you that not because it's anything great, it's just like when you surrender something that you think really, really matters, it's amazing what's provided to you on the other side. And then from that point on, I started taking our family on vacations where we would take part of every vacation and we would do a mission trip. And by mission, I just mean going in and touching and feeling people that are poor or hurting. We went to Thailand and we, we, we spent time with a prostitution ministry where, where the women are pulled out of prostitution, given an opportunity to get off the drugs and to finish their education and then get careers and education and we've been investing in them ever since. We went to Africa and we worked with World Vision and microfinance and we, we spent three days in Swaziland and, and touring that. We went to Uganda and Kenya and Rwanda and Haiti and the Dominican Republic and we started taking trips that had real value. When I see Mickey down here, that. She said she spent the summer in Niger. I've not been to Niger. Our family helps support Niger. Niger's a tough place, guys. Niger's a Muslim country. And there they're serving the Muslim people. What better way to reconcile with a people that is different than us than to go serve in that community and offer them help? They have a fistula ministry, which these poor girls, they have an average of seven or eight kids per woman. They start at like 14 years old. They get ripped up down below, and then they get discarded under the streets. And these guys went over there to fix them. And they teach the doctors how to do that. So when the University of Iowa approached us about doing that, we said, wow, that is really, really cool. And we worked with Robin and, and Susan Bebot is a, is, a, is a doctor who went to school in Iowa and got her medical degree. She's an internist. She moved her family. I mean, she's like blonde with like four towhead kids and her husband. They moved to Niger. <laughs> And they're going to live there for their lifetime. And they started a clinic, and they're helping the people of Niger in the sandlands of Niger have a productive and healthy life. They've got clinics, and they, and they work over there. When we went to Africa, we met a man by the name of Jackson Sinyanga. Jackson Sinyanga was thrown on a dump as a kid. He was so sick, and his parents, his dad was a polygamist. What you don't know about Africa is Africa is full of polygamists. It's like pervasive, multiple, multiple wives. And it, many times women are property over there, and that's another thing we'll, we can talk about later. It's just, but until you go there, until you get proximate, until you show up, you don't know these things. This isn't in the papers. You don't read about this stuff. You want to, you got you have to show up and see it and hear it, what's going on. So Jackson Sinyanga came over to the United States. He spoke at Chicago Fellowship about this great school he was trying to build for the orphans in Kampala, Uganda. And it just resonated. I'd gone on some trips. So I called him over afterwards. I said, I think I'd, I'd like our family to help out with building this primary school. And he said, really? I said, yeah, I really would. And so we gave him some money. And I said, can you get it done by June? I said, and this was in November, and they'd started. And he said, yeah, I think we can. So we gave him the money to finish. I said, I want to bring our family over there. So we brought our family over there. He had this grade school, six stories, built with 800 primary students when we got over there and we spent time in Uganda, they, they threw a festival for us where all these kids surrounded us. They laid hands on us and they prayed for us. I was going, it was so overwhelming, I literally can't even talk about it. It was like these kids had nothing, but they said that we were part of their family because we'd invested in their school and, and the promise. And then Jackson comes back to me. He says, we need to build a high school. These kids have nowhere to go. So we took 11 of the most... I won't say the most prominent, but they were prominent businessmen and their wives over to Africa three years ago. And we raised the capital to build a high school for 3,000. They've got the first two floors built. We're not there. It's an eight and a half, seven and a half million dollar project. We've raised four million. We got the first two floors there. And then guess what? He said, we don't have any housing. So we had to build the housing for them <laughs> and the latrines and the kitchen. And it's like a campus. Right now they have 1,800 people that live on that campus. And then we flew up to Mumbai, Mumbai, where I was talking to Mickey about this. Cure International, I want to tell you another, just another little story about a family, Scott Harrison and his wife Sally. Scott Harrison was an orthopedic surgery, surgeon. He practiced the Ponsetti method. He knew it. He knows it extraordinarily well. Scott's probably 
78 or 80 right now. Scott sold his 30 hospitals for $60 million of equity value to him. He plowed $30 million back into 10 hospitals in the most difficult places in the world. One of them was Mumbali, Uganda. The other one's in Dominican I've been to, in, in uh, Kenya I've been to. He's got one in Dubai. He took places that nobody wants to go to. He said, nobody else is building them here. I'm going to build them. And we're going to practice the Ponsetti method of clubfoot. And we started out with orthopedics and did all the orthopedic things for people that couldn't afford it. But in Mimbali, where we went, he said, we're going to take on hydrocephalus. And there was a Harvard doctor that helped him. His name escapes me right now. That came up with a way, hydrocephalus, if, if any of you have never heard of it, is the swelling water on the brain. So there's a gland that through bacteria gets infected in your brain and secretes an infection and it gets clogged. And what happens, the brain just literally swells with this liquid. So this doctor had, had come up with a method without using shunts, shunts to go into the brain endoscopically, down into one of the ventricles, kill with this laser all the disease, and then drill a hole into the ventricle below it and drain the liquid. And if you get these kids before they're six months old, they live. So we went, and my wife's a surgical nurse from the University of Iowa, and she's fascinated with this stuff. So we went up to, flew up, up to Mumbai, and we saw this hospital. What's it doing in Mumbai? We said, this is where they built the hospital. And people now from Harvard and from John Hopkins and all over the world fly into Mumbai because Scott Harrison and Sally Harrison gave half of their net worth to building hospitals. And we, our foundation has, for the last five years, given money to train two neurosurgeons a year. We've now trained 11 neurosurgeons who have taken their, and then we've given them equipment. They go back to their country, whether it's Kenya or Honduras or wherever. And those, and I tell you this, this is, I don't want to sound, Brett, this, this is, I'm telling you, it's just to show you what can happen. 2,200 lives have been saved with those 11 surgeons already, already. That, to me, is what I, I want to do the rest of my life. That's meaningful. And so I'm looking for those pockets where people have given everything. They've got expertise I don't have. I'm not a surgeon. But, but what I did have the ability to do is I had the ability to earn some money. It's not as much as a lot of people. But, it, but I want to spend the rest of my life continuing to earn so that I can invest in these things and bring my friends and my family members alongside because that's how I think you paint a future that is bright for yourself. That's how I think you paint a future that has value, that your kids can look at you and say, you did something significant. You didn't just build things so that you could create more things, so that you could store more things in your barn, so that when the tornado comes and tears your barn down, you got nothing. You invested in people and things, and that to me is what I'm trying to embark on you today. I want to imbue in you this spirit that you have skills, you have talent, you can have dreams. I will never forget, I had an epiphany on Riverside Drive when I was probably in graduate school. I was driving on my, I had, a, I had an orange Subaru with 110,000 miles on it. I used to do a night route when I was, I still delivered papers in graduate school, but it was one of those night routes in, in, in the countryside. And I had all these miles in this thing. And I remember driving on Riverside Drive, and, and I don't often have these epiphanies, but I had this feeling, that this voice said to me, you're going to be successful in life, but to whom much is given, much is required. You're going to have a burden on you. And this burden is going to be heavy, but you can, you can use it to an advantage. And I never have forgotten that. It was absolutely indelibly etched in my heart, in my soul, in my mind. This burden of to whom much is given, much is required. Just to sit here today, you've been given much. To be able to have a college education and a beautiful city like Iowa City and a great university, you've already been given much. Start thinking right now about somehow avoiding this current that the world has subscribed to, which says, move faster, jump ahead, make more. And start thinking right now about how you can enter into other people's worlds that don't have as much. I've always, I, you know, the, the Apostle Paul's talked about giving, and different people have all sorts of different, but he talked about giving, and he said, you don't want to give reluctantly. You want to give cheerfully. You don't want to give so you feel like you're giving. So many people went to church, you know, whether it's, I went to the Methodist church or the Catholic church or the Lutheran church, and they were taught, prescribed 
that if you give, you can check the box. If you tithe, you can check the box, and then you're done. But that creates bitterness. That's not what we're after. We're after that gift that comes from your heart that you feel like you really, really want to give. And so I'm going to give you a couple suggestions here, just as I finish up, on ways to start this journey. The first is you look around and do you know anybody that's on a journey like this? Go meet with them, talk to them, see if they'll allow you to start a relationship with them. And then have the courage to get proximate, have the courage to do what Mickey did and hop on a plane to Niger, Africa. How bold is that? I mean, you've been reading about Niger in the last few weeks. People killed, Americans killed. In Niger, it's not, a place, it's not a place that you'd want to go to. When we went to Honduras, there was uprising, there was, there was drug trafficking, there was poverty. There was a prison right outside our hotel. It wasn't safe, but we went and we were protected and we started a journey. Get proximate. Do life in community. Don't do life isolated. Find the people that have the values that you want and lock arms with them. Don't go chasing after the people that are living the past life, the life that you've seen that is so ephemeral. It just vanishes. Look at the people that are digging in, that are willing to sacrifice, that are, that are, that are humble and modest. And do, life, do life with them. You know, I think that we're God's workmanship. He's given us hands and a mind, and, and we're supposed to do his work. That's how we create value in our lives. That's what I believe. You don't have to believe that, but I believe we do. And when you have that sense of purpose that you're actually being used as the hands and feet of, of God himself, you can have passion in doing this life, and you can look and analyze the things that you've got in your life that you've been given and decide how you want to use them. So that's what I have for you this morning. I'm certainly willing to answer any questions. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I'm on a journey. And it's a journey. It's not a destination. And it's a journey you want to do with people that you really love and respect. And I just encourage you all to start the journey today. Thank you. So if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take a, a few here today. Anybody? OK. That's good. <laughs> Let's get started. All right, thanks. Please. Thank you, Andy. Thank you all for joining. The message, it's all in your hands. You've got to take the first steps. And oh, what a journey Andy has been on. Thank you very much for sharing that. Let's all leave and take the first steps. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>